In this video, we'll be proving a result known as Cantor's theorem. Cantor's theorem states that there is no surjective function from a type x onto a type x to prop. So we write this out. There is no function f from x to x to prop such that f is surjective. So let's take a moment to look at the definition of surjective. A function f from x to y is called surjective if for every y in y there exists an x in x so that f of x equals y. So this is the definition of surjective f. Actually, the definition also depends on the types x and y, but let me leave that dependence implicit. In this particular case, the y is the type x to prop, and the x is the type x. So in the particular case of Cantor's theorem, such a surjective f would satisfy for all y in x arrow prop there exists an x x such that f of x equals y. Now note that this is a function type x arrow prop. So let's use the name g for this bound variable. The names of bound variables don't matter, so we'll just rename it to g. g is the kind of name we often use for a function. So when we try to prove Cantor's theorem, we'll assume we have a surjective f, so that means it will satisfy this, and we'll need to apply that assumption with an appropriate function g from x to prop. So what function g should we use? Of course, this is called Cantor's theorem because it was first proven by Cantor. And Cantor was the first person to use a certain technique that's sometimes called diagonalization. And in this example, we have a function f, which we can think of as a function of two arguments both of those arguments being of the same type x. Since they're of the same type x, we can apply it to the same argument twice. And this is in some sense looking at the diagonal of f. So if we say lambda x of type x, fxx, you can think of this as the diagonal of f. Now this is a potential candidate for this g, but if we use this, it won't help us do the proof. What we actually need to do is look at the anti-diagonal. So we'll negate this fxx. This gives us a function from x to prop. So it's the kind of function we can use for this g. And that's the one we'll use. So let's start doing the proof. We'll start off by assuming we have a function f from x to x to prop and an assumption A that F is surjective. And we need to prove false. Now, as I've already said, the idea of the proof is to use this assumption A with an appropriate G, and let's define this G locally to be the anti-diagonal lambda x, not F x x. Now, if we look at A applied to G, the type of this is there exists an X in X so that F of X equals G. So this proof term justifies adding two new assumptions, an X of type X and an assumption that F of this X equals G. So let's do that here. X has type X, and now I have an assumed proof B of f of x equals g. Now I still need to prove false. How can I prove this? In fact, what I'll do is I'll first prove a little lemma and then I'll use this lemma to prove false. So let's first prove gx is equivalent to fxx. This is very easy to prove because I can use this assumption B to rewrite this fx to be g, and now what I need to do is prove gx is equivalent to gx 
But this is obvious by reflexivity of equivalence. So this is just tautological, we're done. So now that I've proven this equivalent, I can use it as an assumption. Let's call this assumption C. Now I still need to prove false. If I unfold the definition of this G in this new assumption C, I see that what I have is not FXX is equivalent to FXX. So this assumption C says that we have a proposition, in this case FXX, which is equivalent to its own negation. Now this is tautologically impossible, so false follows from this tautologically, and we're done. So clearly the important part of this proof was the appropriate choice of G. In particular, choosing it to be this anti-diagonal function, lambda x, not fxx.